Okay, welcome everyone to the San Diego chapter of Papers We Love. Uh, our speaker this evening is Ben Sima, a self-described Haskell and Closure hacker. Uh, and he's going to be presenting a categorical theory of patches by Samuel Mimram and Cinzia Di Giusto. Let's have a big round of applause for Ben Sima. All right, thanks everyone for coming out. Appreciate it. Um, uh, so these are just some links to the, um, the slides and everything if you want to follow along. Um, the way I organize this talk is actually I'm approaching it from a programmer's perspective. I assume everyone here is familiar with like Git and patches and so on. Um, I think it's a lot easier to deal with patches than it is with category theory. And I'm not an expert in category theory. So um, I'm... Uh, uh, going to be building up some category, ca category theory concepts using patches. Um, and I think that'll be a good way to sort of kind of intuit the concepts that we're dealing with. Um, out of curiosity, is anyone here like good at category theory? Just wondering what level am I? No? Okay. Um, does anyone, does everyone here know, does anyone here uh, know what a monad is? Like they could explain what a monad is. Okay. You missed, but I did the monads paper. You missed it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, I forgot we did that one. Okay. All right. Just trying to gauge where we're at. Um, yeah. So you don't have to know category theory, obviously, to, to work with patches. You don't have to know category theory to work with Haskell um, or anything like that. Um, the way I approach this is that category theory is like bumper rails on your program design. So it's really nice to have those bumper rails to help you design proper programs. Um, and you'll see, I think, when we get into the weeds, how, how uh, category theory kind of pushes you into proper program design uh, from the perspective of patches. So um, I'm relying, uh, well, we'll just jump into it. So first, let's consider the life of a patch, what happens when you create a patch and what happens when you apply it. Um, you'll start by creating a file. Right. For example, let's imagine that the Cavs are putting together their starting lineup for the game that we're not watching right now. And um, uh, they might be saying, okay, we're going to have George Hill as a point guard, Kyle Korver as the uh, uh, shooting guard, uh, J.R. Smith as the power forward. And then, um, you know, LeBron James, because he's like the captain of the team, he'll say, you know what, I'm going to be the small forward. He edits the file and he puts his, his name in there. And then maybe the uh, at the same time, the coach says, we're going to put Kevin Love at center. Um, so now we have both people editing the same line of the same file here. So, you know, we have a merge conflict. Um, this is how Git would represent that same thing. Um, the problem is that this doesn't, allow us to have any sort of a mathematical understanding of what's happening here. We have, if you think about the tree of uh, git commits, we have a source, two, two, uh, two forks, and you know how do we have to bring them together. Um, to visualize this sort of, to, to make a step from this textual representation that git gives us to a more mathematical uh, understanding where you can reason about the objects and the the differences between them, we can start to visualize this like, like this. So if we think about um, a file as a, uh, a series of functions, you might say that it's um, first you start with an empty file, okay, and then you add a single line, that, that first edition would be George Hill, <clears throat> that's now the root of the next edition, the next edition would be Kyle Korver, and from there, we have our branching of two different possibilities, either add LeBron James or add Kevin Love, right? Um, so this, and then, so LeBron James and Kevin Love both have a common ancestor, and they would have a common descendant, I guess, uh, J.R. Smith, right? So if we think about it in these terms, we can start to go, move towards a more mathematical understanding. Um, I'll show that in a second. So this is obviously what we want to get to, right? Um, <clears throat> the paper gives us actually a, uh, 
uh, mathematical theory for how to create um, from this gives us this, right? And it does so by basically forgetting about this thing. You abstract away from this textual representation into more of a diagrammatic uh, representation. So the goal of my talk is going to be to convince you that, one, the diagrammatic representation is the same as the textual representation, and that using category theory, we can actually go from the textual representation to the diagrammatic to the final object. <clears throat> okay. So Joe Neiman uh, is a mathematician, I forget where, but he's a mathematician that wrote a blog article um, describing a tool called Pajul, which is this like Git clone, I guess, that uses um, the theories in this paper plus some extra work to get rid of merge conflicts. It's kind of alpha software, so I haven't been able to use it. But um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm relying on his articles because they really helped explain some of this stuff. So what we're going to do is diagram a three-way merge. It's easier to visualize than just what I showed you before. Um, and we'll use that as a way to move into category theory. So first of all, <clears throat> we have these three patches. Okay. <clears throat> um, the way to understand this diagram, uh, can, can everyone see that? Do you need some help? Or, okay. So I know it's kind of small, but um, so the way to understand this is zero, or O rather, it's a capital letter O, is the initial file, the empty file, um, or just the file that you're starting with. And then you have a patch P, and that results in uh, the descending file A. So if you apply the patch P, then you get A. Right? If you apply the patch Q, you get B, and with R, you get C. These are three completely different files after you you uh, start with, with the original. There are actually three ways to merge these back together, theoretically, right? I'm not going to... So what we're doing right now, right now is we're not dealing with the specifics of, like, what lines are going to be acceptable and what the end result we want it to look like. We're just thinking in an abstract way, you know, what are the possibilities for this? Um, so this is the first step of abstracting away to get to the categories, the categorical theoretical way of thinking about this. Um, so the first way to merge this, A, um, what you'd, <clears throat> the, so, so the first method of merging this would be, uh, has, it has two steps. First, you would merge P and Q um, to create this file M, right? Uh, to do this, you have to have two intermediate steps. Uh, one patch would be M, one patch would be N. These are like imaginary, just, you know. Um, uh, if you were manually doing this, and you'd have to, you know, if you're working with Git, you have to manually construct this M or this N patch. Um, and after you've done that, you'll, you'll get this M file, which is the result of merging. Um, from there, then you can merge C in there. Uh, using some imaginary patch Y, and then you would finally get your end result. And so the way um, we can reason about this a little bit more mathematically is thinking about the combination of the patch P and M uh, is the same as a combination of patches Q and N. So those are presumably equivalent, right? Does anyone disagree? Where, which one is Q? I can't read it. <laughs> so this is P. Oh, that's pretty good. Oh, I see it. Yeah, this is P M Q N, uh, and that's a capital M. So um. The ones on the bottom gonna be instead of X and Y. Uh, that's R and Y. That's X. See. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I can make it larger. That's okay. That's okay. Okay. Um, yeah, these are also on, uh, if you want to check out the slides, um, on those links I sent. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's the first method we could use. The second method is <clears throat> basically just the verse of that. See, this one is merging B and C first, and then merging A into that. Um, and the third way would be to take, uh, uh, merge P and Q to get intermediate M here, uh, here, and then 
merge Q and R to get this intermediate N here. And then presumably it's a simple thing to merge N and M into Q. I think you're mixing the language, right? We want to mix, we want to merge A and B and B and C? Or yeah, what do, what do you consider oh, yeah. merge? Merging two files or merging two change sets? There's kind of not a difference between the two, really, because if you take P and Q and you combine those two things, um, then you get a single merge Right, or, or a single patch, rather, sorry, a single patch that represents the movement from O all the way over here to M. So part of the point is that patches, um, these arrows between between things, uh, can commute, they, they, or sorry, they can compose together, right? And we know that, you know, in practice, we have patches that compose because we send multiple patches in a pull request on GitHub and stuff. So, um, then in that... Sorry. So then in that graph, then the arrow between B and M should be P, and the arrow between A and M should be Q, right? Because if going the top route, it'd be Q after P. Going the bottom route, it's P after Q, but you ultimately get to the same application. Um, well, these are actually intermediate patches. So it can't necessarily be the same set of changes yeah. between B and M as just straight up P. Yeah, the thing they'll have to do to go from O to M with these intermediate A and B is actually derive or create or somehow come up with these intermediate steps, which are functions or patches that, you know, we might have to manually type out or um, something could derive for us. Hopefully we get something could drive it for us. And when you say three-way merge, is this like three-way merge that we're familiar with from Git or is this, are you literally trying to merge three patches? Uh, it's, that's the same thing, isn't it? I mean, typically you, in have, Git, three. you, you have the, Side A, um, or, you know, some other branch that you're trying to merge from, mm. you know, master or whatever branch you're presently on, and then whatever yeah. conflicting branch like in vimdiff or edif or whatever. I I don't know what it seems like. This is, represents three patches. So I, yeah. I wasn't. So um, you could argue that in that situation, when you're merge, you're doing a three-way merge and git, head is the result of some other patch. Right. So I see. I see. yeah. Do you have a question? So what I'm confused about here is the distinction between the document states and the patches, because it seems like those nodes ought to be you know, the state of the document, and then the transitions between them should be the patches that you apply to get from one document state to another document state. So I think that that's where I'm yeah. getting confused as to what is a patch and what is a, a document state. Does that make sense? Yeah, what you said is correct. Um, yeah, a document state or just a file, you know, some re concrete representation of the file that you would that would not have the arrows with the merge conflicts. Those are all of the nodes in here. And then the patches are the arrows. So the patches are like transformations between files, right? Yeah, or document states. Um, so with that in mind, um, as I guess all of your questions just kind of uh, got to, we have to come up with a way to um, take this sort of general way of transitioning between states and turn it into the files and, and the patches that we are um, uh, used to dealing with. Um, so to do that, uh, we use category theory. And since I'll, I'll give some background on category theory and I'll kind of work the, the definitions into this. Um, paper does is it comes up with a, uh, a category of files, I guess, you, the, the file category. Um, <clears throat> so to understand the category that he comes up with, we have to start with um, what are morphisms. So a category, just in category theory, a category has two classes of objects inside of it. It has morphisms and it has um, objects. The objects are like the files that we're dealing with. The morphisms are basically just functions. You think of, think of them as functions, but they're not quite like functions in uh, like Python or something if you're writing a function. A morphism actually preserves the structure. So a morphism from a list to a list, uh, you know, that uh, uh, preserves the structure of the list, even though you might have a list of integers coming in and a list of strings going out. 
in Haskell, uh, I mean, they mirror the math syntax pretty closely. So you would have, this is your type signature in Haskell, and then this is your uh, math notation. Um, in the papers, morphisms are almost always lowercase letters. So um, sometimes they're called arrows too, because they're just arrows on the diagram. Um, so uh, the other class is objects. They're usually upper class or uppercase letters. You can think of an object in category theory kind of like as a set, but with more structure. In set theory, a set is just an arbitrary grouping of some objects, right? Um, or an ar arbitrary grouping of some values. In category theory, an object has a little bit more structure. So it's more of a, um, an emphasis on the relationships between the elements in the set. You might say that um, uh, an object is um, all like elements of a list. So they all have, you know, um, two con cells or whatever. Um, uh, that might be a, an object in category theory or something like that. So basically just non-arbitrary groupings. Um, uh, I guess I'll explain a little bit. I don't know too much about the origins of type theory, but one thing I know that does help kind of situate category theory in relationship to other programming concepts is that, um, so uh, Russell, um, no, Bertrand Russell created type theory out of the paradoxes of set theory, right? And, you know, because you had these like paradoxes between you know, what's the set of all sets or whatever is the set of all sets contain itself, right? That was Russell's paradox. And so he created type theory to handle those, those uh, paradoxes in set theory. And then from there, you had um, uh, people starting talking, like grouping types into different categories and things like that. And um, so each time they're creating this thing, it's like going up a level in abstraction, right? So if you're working with a dynamic language like Python or Clojure, you're dealing mostly at the level of set theory where you don't have these categories of types to like work with. You only have values and sets. Um, but as you use more advanced type systems, you have these like higher level abstractions for um, uh, talking about what's in the sets. Um, maybe that's not very specific, but that sort of thing helps me. So yeah, basically objects are like um, really structured sets. Um, question? Um, when you say like uh, morphism is structured preserving, is that, does that mean it's like you can go in one direction and go in the other direction as a bijection? Or like what, what do you mean by structured preserving? More specifically? I mean, <clears throat> um, uh, a mor you can have a morphism from a list to another list, right? And all the items inside the list might change. You might have um, um, uh, an integer change to a string, but you still have that list structure. So what's a list? It's you know, it's you, ha you have these con cells and one points to the reverse, you know, so on and so forth. Um, so if you had a tree, for example, you know, red black tree or whatever, you could have a morphism over that tree that turns it into something else, turns it into a list maybe. But you could have a morphism. Go one way. Go the other way. I'm, uh, I'm not sure if you can go both ways like that. I don't know. I don't really know. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, presumably, if you go one way, you should be able to go the opposite. You well, know, I'm, like I'm thinking, okay, a list. It, it's a morphism that starts with a list that has ten elements, and yeah. then it just randomly removes one. Yeah. You can't go. You can't go the other way, right? You can't like take the output of mm. that function and go back to the input. I think actually, actually I think the, the term structure -preser preserving function is really usually structure preserving morphism and it's usually functors that are structure preserving morphisms. But you can have something like a catamorphism, which is what we call a fold. So if you run a reduce. Oh, okay, and that's not reversible. It's not reducible, yeah. You're throwing information away. So morphisms don't necessarily have to go in both directions. A morphism really is just a function. It's a transition from a state to a state. Sorry. I'm very informal with this stuff, so thank you. <laughs> I'll get another question, maybe? Um, yeah, so, all right, so we have this idea of an object. 
and we have to get our patches into this definition of an object. To do that, what the authors do is they define, um, <clears throat> it's actually pretty simple, a line is just a set of words, and a file is um, an index on those lines. If, you, know, you open your editor, you have a list of natural numbers on the left side, those are your line numbers, and then you have sets of words that go horizontally across the screen, those are um, the lines. So we, we define those two things. Whenever you see this capital A, it's going to be a, just a file, or lowercase a is just a file. And then, yeah, L is just, uh, um, uh, just presumably this is some, like, an ordered set or something. I don't think I want my words to be unordered in my files. Um, a file morphism consists of two functions, insertion and deletion. Um, so we have this function, eta of A, which takes some, uh, I they don't actually define I in the paper, but I'm pretty sure it stands for some the identity of some file. Um, and then it returns um, the line in that file. So you're inserting uh, uh, whatever line A is. And then deletion epsilon is the same thing, or the reverse is the same thing. Together, that's what a patch is. It's just insertions and deletions of, of uh, lines in a file. So here we have our objects and morphisms. That means we can have a category. Um, and so if you look up category, this is what you get from Wikipedia. And it actually translates to like this Haskell code pretty one-to-one. -one. You have um, F is a morphism from A to B. G is a morphism from B to C. And if you compose those two, you get a morphism from A to C. You just line up the types. Uh, so that is basically the definition of our L category. Uh, in the paper, they use that squig fancy squiggly L, but I can't figure out how to draw that in Emacs. So we have um, a fancy L category, uh, which is actually monoidal. So what does it mean to be monoidal? It means um, first you have to have a, it's called a bifunctor. It's just a function of two arguments which says um, if you put together two kinds of things and you get the same thing back. So if you put together two integers, you get an integer back. Um, that's what this bifunctor uh, image means. Uh, also called the tensor product sometimes. Um, to be monoidal, it also has to have a unit or an identity object. And it has to be associative, so it doesn't matter where you put the parentheses around two products. Um, and then left and right identities refers to whether or not you can switch the A and the B around. If you can move this A over here, um, and it still means the same thing, then that means it's strict monoidal. So our fancy L category is actually strict monoidal. Um, if um, the unit is just an empty file, okay, uh, with no lines in it. Um, if we have a list of lines m, so a file, right, and a list of n lines, uh, and we put them together, we just get a longer file, right? It's like cat in, in Unix. Um, and then that file is structure preserving because if you index it on i, if you index the, comp the composition of those two files on i, and i is less than m, then you get back a, and if it's more than M, then you get back you get back B. So it seems intuitive when we're working with patches, right? If you take two files and you put one on top of the other, you know, the order is going to stay the same. Um, so this proves that fancy L category is strictly an order. Yeah. Sorry, it's a little dense. I worked with this pretty closely. But is it so? The thing is that if you add M and M together in a different order, you're going to get a different sequence in the file. No? Yes. But that's just like renaming the files. I mean, <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? Right. Uh, are you questioning if it's um, strictly? Well, could it be strict in the middle, but not in the middle? Uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. Strictly in the middle doesn't mean commutative. Exactly. 
Right. It's, it's commutativity, so it's better. But I don't totally see, okay, but it's not commutative, but could you go back to the last bullet point on the previous slide? Okay, yeah. So left and right identities are. You might just have to go over that one. Yeah. <laughs> I don't totally get it. What do you need to be strict? Yeah, so um, the left and right identities just refer to, um, as I understand it, if you take uh, this A and this B and you switch them around, it means the same thing, right? Um, uh, that if, if it means the same thing, then it's strict monoidal. If it doesn't, then it's non strict monoidal. But um, a good way to think about this is, uh, I, think, um, I think it's a good way. Thinking about just like multiplying numbers, right? If you take... 5 times 10, and you reverse it 10 times 5, it's the same. So those are strict monoidal. So then maybe that does work. <coughs> it's commutative. Like, to be a strict monoid means you get you have the normal stuff, and you're commutative. Okay. So I'm around? I don't know. Okay. I, I'm I, 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 I had the same question. Like, what, what, is there an, a separate terminology here, or is, is monoidal... A general class of commutivity across all kinds of identities that exist on numbers or, or, or objects. I mean, what does it mean for to be monoidal? Is a category like a category can be monoidal. It's a it's an adjective on top of a category, and it has to satisfy these laws right. or these you know these these constraints. <clears throat> I guess it would make. I was thinking of the next slide as lines, but if they're patches, then it would make sense. Um, so the yes. bifunctor of M and N, if those are actual patches, they're going to equal the same thing no matter what. Oh, yeah. They might be patches, I can't remember. Well, yeah, I guess this is this is operating at a level of abstraction that I'm not. I mean, wouldn't you also have to have an operator? I mean, we, the, the numbers obviously don't have all shared properties depending on the operator that's operating upon them. Yeah, so what what is what is I'm, I'm wondering like what is the what is the operator upon these things and what is, <coughs> what is the object which the categories represent? Okay. So did you want to? You know? I I also had a question, so I don't know. Okay, so well, let me answer that real quick. I think the operator is this bifunctor, which is just a um a product of putting the two things together. That's kind of how I think of it, right? So this is a list of patches and this is a list of patches. If you put together two lists, then you have a longer list, right? Mm -hmm. And that operator just means concatenate? In so, this case, it does, yes. Yeah, a monoid, it's going to be the set of stuff, it could be the numbers, and then the operator. So you got to pick one, you got to yeah. addition. Or oh, operators. okay. Right, so the people will typically say that integers form a monoid over mm -hmm. um, multiplication with the identity function being one, or they form a monoid over addition, with, uh, over addition with the identity function being zero. So you can kind of say... Oh yeah, that's we qualify those two. Ways. <clears throat> Where is fancy L defined? What is fancy L? Yeah, um, it's a category. What does that mean? <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so here's here's where it's defined. This is the third page of the paper. Um. So. Yeah, what is a category? That's a good question, dude. Um, <laughs> all right, so a category is to, it, it contains two things, just morphisms and objects, right? So in the case of patches, we have our morphisms, our patches, and our objects are files. And that's, okay. It doesn't enforce anything on the morphisms and objects. You just choose some objects, choose some morphisms, and then you can say things about your category. You can try and say things, yeah. yeah and, and then you have to it. prove it, you know? <laughs> like, yeah, um, yeah. There are certain things like um, uh, right, morphism. So we're, proving, we're defining this arbitrary category. We're just choosing some morphisms and some objects. Where the first thing we're going to prove here is that it's strictly monoidal. Yes. Sweet. Yeah, that's it. I like thinking of math in terms of like constructing, you know, so we're constructing this new category. Yeah. And we're just inventing it. Just, yeah, just I like wasn't sure playing if we Legos started or something. Like, yeah, I don't know. I, I thought maybe it was more specific about what the category 
is. Yeah, category theory is wrapped up in all this like really complex language, but when you get down to it, it's just like, really <laughs> abstract Legos that you're playing with. Or something like that. Is this going to be on the internet? <laughs> um, anyways. Um, so, yeah, this proves, right? I hope it convinces you, at least. That's all the proof is, it's something that convinces you, right? Um, I hope this convinces you that fancy L is strictly monoidal. And then it's also free monoidal. This is the second proposition. Um, uh, I'm not quite sure what free monoidal refers to, but according to the paper, um, we have this insertion operation, this deletion operation, and together you compose those two together, and you have the original thing that you start out with. So, um, uh, this um, means that we can go backwards and forwards, I guess, between between directions on the on the graph. Okay, so we've gotten that far. Yes, but we still have to get to get to this. Right, so far we've defined our arrows, we've defined our uh, objects, you know, the nodes in the graph. Um, to get from this monoidal thing to a diagram, uh, we have to know what a diagram is. <clears throat> now this is pretty abstract, but you can think of um, a diagram as a sort of indexing applied to um, the categories objects and morphisms. Okay. Uh, formally, it's just a functor that um, includes uh, the objects and the morphisms of a category. The analog to set theory is kind of helpful, though, because in set theory, um, you uh, you can index a set, in which case you know you have some objects in the set, and then you just put an indexing of like natural numbers on top of them, right? So you just put like you know, one, two, three, and so on, on the set. A diagram is kind of like the same thing, but in set theory, you can only account for values. In category theory, we can account for values, which are the objects in the category, and the morphisms between them. So a diagram actually indexes the, uh, the object and the morphisms. So it's like an indexing on top of that, kind of. Um, there are two factors to a diagram. One is the cone, which is consists, it's defined by all of the morphisms um, on a category's objects that commute. Okay, So um, again, the morphisms are the arrows. And to commute means to end up at the same place, basically. right? They, they give you the same result. So a cone would look basically something like this right here. right? Because these are all of the morphisms, the arrows, and they're going to the same place. Um, and plus it kind of looks like a cone, just kind of like goes in that direction, right? It's really not that creative. Um, and then a limit, this one really confused me for a while, but it's really just a unique morphism within the cone. Uh, so um, the unique morphism would be like this, this one right here, this from B to N, that's one of the limits. You can have multiple limits. And then there's also, uh, when they say co-limit, or uh, co-cone, it refers to going the opposite direction. So they, I guess you can go backwards. Um, now, the way to think about this uh, that I've been kind of using, um, I mean, you can't just use the literal definition of it's, it's a unique morphism within the cone. I kind of think of it um, from a calculus perspective. You can kind of think of it as like, okay, here's the space of all of the potential things that you can do within the the, um, the area of this cone, right? And then the limit is right here, and that's what we only, that's what we care about, right? We don't really care about any of this because it doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't actually point to another object. Any questions about that? Yeah? Any objections? Definitely no Eric? objections. <laughs> uh, smart enough to object. Um, so when we talk here about morphisms commuting, Right, so I get the idea that there are many ways to get to the, the end state there. Mm -hmm. But a morphism is a single arrow. Yes. And you know, if I take any pair of these, they don't necessarily seem to commute. It seems to be paths, the last one, yes. that would commute. Yes. So is it 
essentially like sets of morphisms commute with other sets of morphisms yeah. and not individual ones. Correct. But conceivably not all morphisms commute. The cone is the set of all morphisms that do commute. Is that yeah, it? that's correct. Okay. That's like almost exactly the definition that I found on the internet. <laughs> right, so that do commute. So here you essentially collapsing, you know, in this diagram we have three arrows that get us to the final state. We're collapsing those three arrows into a single morphism. We can, yeah. yeah. The cone is only the stuff to the right of, of here. Okay, it's only this part. This Why triangle. Is that? Um, because. Because it looks like. Because it looks like a cone, yeah. <laughs> I feel like I could probably redraw the first half to also look like a cone. <laughs> Don't focus on the ice cream, focus on the cone. I mean, <laughs> actually, I guess this is like the. Starting, like, this is the category right here, I guess, you know? This is the category they're starting with. So, I mean, you could start from over here and say this is all the cone or something like that, but it's, it's, it's kind of relative to whatever you set up the problem to be at the beginning. So we've set up the problem to be this A, B, C with P, Q, R, this part right here that we're starting with. And we say, all right, from this starting point, this is the cone. Oh, okay. I thought that in this paper, though, they actually said, so this diagram commutes as a result, it's a category, which is like the, sure, probably, maybe I'm wrong about that. But I thought that, so that's you, three things you need to actually form a category. You need objects, you need morphisms, and you need a diagram that commutes, and then you can say, this forms altogether, forms a category. Uh, I think you only need two. Am I wrong about that? I could be wrong. I thought they said that in this paper. Uh, like, okay. Oh, yeah, I guess that's the third thing you need to have a complete category. I don't know. I thought, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I thought you need the commutation. The, the, the commuting to have a diagram, not necessarily a category. Well, a diagram is just a, a way of describing the whole, okay. everything, the objects of the morphisms. Mm -hmm. so, but it may or may not commute. Honestly, I feel like a lot of this stuff is still being worked out. <laughs> so some of the information I find is like a little, it's not, I mean, it's on the internet, so it's not like peer reviewed. Uh, so trying to get really technical is difficult. Um, Wait, here uh, we're talking about like visual or category theory. Uh, I'm talking about cate category theory, like a lot of stuff. A lot of out, right? what? <laughs> I think it's pretty ironed out, right? Like it's been around for a long time. Oh, um, I'm just referring to the sources that I'm okay. reading, like you know, Wikipedia sometimes says iffy language and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, can you, as like a real world example, can you think of a tone as patches that? Uh, yes, exactly. Actually, I guess it's part of this theory to say that all patches do uh, commute, like they, they all form a cone. So how that works in practice and how, how that works in Pajul is kind of, you know, not super, um, it's not ideal, but in the realm of these diagrams, actually, all patches do have a have a conflict-free uh, way of merging. Um, so, in, in terms of Git, then yeah, you know, like if you merge a bunch of patches and they don't conflict, then it, it had to form a cone. But there might be a, a different outcomes. So you, you, the, you could choose to apply that patches in at least the patches of There's different ways of resolving merge conflict. So the thing is that, that does that mean that the model is imperfect? No, it means Git's imperfect. <laughs> so the model actually is perfect. Git is imperfect. But, 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 but the thing is, there can be multiple ways of of, uh, uh, of doing the patch. At least the intent. I guess it's the intent of the original programmers that created those uh, patches. Because you're yeah. saying that like there there is a, a an absolute way of reserving of resolving any merge. <laughs> And that may be true, although it wouldn't actually be something which would compile. Yeah, um, so the absolute way of resolving this merge conflict, which is what you say in Git, is actually to do this. Like, that's the end result, right? But isn't that, that arbitrary? Like, and, and he, he presents, like, he, there's no mathematical theory that could account for the behavior of all computer programs. So uh, <laughs> and that would be required to understand what the desired patch is. Well, th okay, so there's no... There, there, there is a theory that describes the merging of this, uh, of these patches, and this, you know, this is what you result in, right? But there's nothing that says that to go from this 
you get to this. That's the problem. Is that this is a this is a multi-dimensional graph that is constructed internally in the visual program. And you know, in category theory, we have the tools to talk about this multi-dimensional graph. But in files, we don't. So we have to just collapse it into something, right? Um, into so that's the problem. The problem is with our our uh, text-based tools. Right, so category theory only gets us to that previous slide. It doesn't get us to there. Okay, right. so this is the end state. Yeah, and then the way that Pajul handles this is to just kind of like guess, kind of. And in most cases, you can take Kevin Love and put him under LeBron James and they'll just it'll be fine. So that's kind of a heuristic that it uses. Um, I think it's it's still in alpha, I mean, it's alpha software, so it's kind of still being worked out. Do you have a question? Oh, no, I was just going to say, so the next slide is just arbitrary, basically. It's just an arbitrary solution. Sort of, yeah. It could be deterministically arbitrary, though. <laughs> yeah, it could just always take the thing on the right and put it on yeah, the... Yeah, just put everything right next to one another. Yeah, no, just, uh, just, just by alpha or, or what have you. Yeah, I, no, I see. Just, I it could be deterministic and still not necessarily be what you intended. You mean deterministic as in solved by another algorithm. Meaning, meaning that it uh, that it, it, it in like many patches could be commutative, um, and it might not be what you want to have happen, but uh, but it, you could still have it commute potentially. Uh, yeah, but just on the basis so. of, of deterministic ordering. I think. That in particular is still being worked on in Pajul, at least from the last that I read. It's not. It's not necessarily what the user wants. Yeah, it could be made to work. Yeah, and then there is a way like um, Pajul in particular stores internally this representation, so there is a way to access that. I think I haven't again. I haven't worked with Pajul, but from what I've read, you can kind of like get access to this representation, um, and then presumably pick which end result you want. And that seems like a solvable problem, right? Um, in terms of like user interface or whatever. So, any other question? No. Okay. So, anyways, right? Diagrams. Um, uh, sort of give an example of a limit. Um, if a category has only two objects and the limit is just binary one zero, right? Um, so it scans like the concrete like representations of all the potentialities within that within that category. Um, another distinction that the paper makes is these are actually co-limits, not limits. I don't really understand the difference between these two, um, but whatever. Um, I, I think. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Because it's commute, co limit. Um, so that a prefix probably means something. So, yeah, this, this one has a, def, has a, um, a destination. Okay, and this finally, now that we know what category is, we know what um, a diagram is, and so on, we can get to a push app. Um, and this is what the, the proof in the paper. It says that anytime we have these diverging patches, we can get to a common descendant. Uh, it uses a push out to prove this. So a push out is, it requires some object P we have here, um, two morphisms, X, uh, yeah, X to P and Y to P. And then um, we have this function F from Z to X and another function G from Z to Y. So those are diverging. And then we have these two morphisms that have a common uh, output. And then when you apply it to those original two functions, you get a common um, descendant. Uh, the push out technically constructs this U here, which is like this, um, uh, the limit of the two morphisms, I guess, or the co-limit rather. Um, so, and then this diagram looks a lot like this diagram, right? Um, so that's how you get from the divergence to the reconvergence. Um, question? Maybe slightly off topic, but do you know if there's a term for the relationship between I1 and G? I do not know. Hmm. 
Does anyone else know the term? I'm curious too. Oh no, I just, I mean, they're not inverse. They're yeah, con converse. I1 and G. Parallel. Yeah, this is I1 here. It's from X to P, and this is G here. So I1 from Z to plus G Z to Y. gets us from Z to P. I1 plus F gets us from Z to P. So there's a relationship between I1 and G, but I1 is not the inverse, it's derived from G. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of off topic. Typically, that's how they draw functors, actually. Because you imagine a functor as a, as a structure for preserving, preserving morphism, so you have like a bare thing in Z and a structured thing in X. That represents Z, but it's structured somehow. Mm -hmm. You go from X to P, and if you can go from Z to Y and Y to P, uh, the functor is the morphism on the left. And it's, that, it's like a map for a list, for example. You're preserving the structure of your list, but you're transforming uh, your original base value inside. Yeah. That relationship is called a functor, typically. So that's that could kind of be the term in both ways. I usually think of functors as just mappings. You know, you map over a list or something. Or a for loop, maybe, <laughs> to make it a little bit more concrete. Um, <clears throat> so if we apply this to our patch situation, we have um, patches P and R, which are like over here, uh, F and G. And they're diverging, you know, giving us two completely different files. And then the fact that we have a push out implies that um, there are some intermediate patches that we can derive that will result in Q, right? Um, uh, perfect merge, no merge conflicts. Um, and then, like we are saying, whether or not you can flatten that file into a, uh, a you know, reasonable list of lines is another question, and that's not addressed in the paper. But the fact that we've gotten to a push out does convince me anyways that patches are um, commut commutative. Um, there's, there are a few more details in the paper that I either couldn't understand or, you know, can get to. Um, category of conflicting files creates another category that is similar but uses like pre-sheaves, and I, I don't understand pre-sheaves. If anyone does, uh, I could use some help on that. <laughs> but that's, that's pretty much as far as I got. I'm hoping, oh, I spilled the I'm hoping that what I explained today will kind of get you to the point where you could tackle it on your own, or we could follow up next month with... Can you go back to your picture of the, the push-out picture? Yeah. So what, what is this whole thing the push-out, or is there some uh, part of this? Um, the push-out is created by these, these two morphisms that result in P, okay? So it starts here, and then the, you know, it, it includes this whole cone here as well. Definition I read was that if you have a morphism X to Q and a morphism Y to Q, and you also have a morphism X to P and a morphism Y to P, then there must be a relationship between P and Q represented by the morphism U, and that's what makes it a push out the fact that there is a morphism yeah. U. So you can go from P to Q, or you can go from X and Y to Q. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, too, from the blog post, it needs to be, there can only be one U. Oh yeah, that's, that's the other thing. Yeah, that's the, oh. the key that's part. A unique it needs to be a U. unique U that yeah obeys all those other properties. Okay. And that's yeah what is essentially like oh there was no merge conflict here. Okay. Yeah, that and, unique uh, U. That, yeah, yeah well, they they call that the in the blog post they call it a perfect merge. Yeah. In the paper they call it a push out. So calling it a push out is this way of saying that U must exist. I think it's probably an entire another talk to talk about how a push out implies that you exist. <laughs> but, but it's the opposite, right? It's that you exist, now this thing is push out. No, no, I don't think so. I think it's the fact that this I1 and I2 exists that implies that there's a U. Uh, or that there's an I2, I1 and I2 and a J1, J2 that implies that there's a U. Could you clarify, in this particular case, what the difference is between I1 and J1, uh, mm -hmm. I2, J2, and correspondingly P and Q? Uh, yeah, so P is an object, so it's like a file, right? Mm -hmm. Intermediate patch, inter intermediate result of a patch. Q is some other file, some other intermediate result of a patch. 
or actually the end result patch. Mm -hmm. And then I1, J1, I2, and J2 are all uh, patches that either do exist or could exist um, if we were to go from this X all the way out to this Q. At least for the sake so of this, this particular diagram, I'm struggling a little bit to understand what the difference between I1 and J1 is. They, they would have, at least superficially be, uh, appear to be identical. Well, they not get you to different objects. So yeah. I1 is a representation of transition from X to B. Mm -hmm. yeah. X, maybe I1 doesn't have to play. I'm explaining that. Yeah, they're different patches. Yeah. Hmm. I so, see. Ah. So J2 so P and Q and J1 to get Q. Because if you just have I1 and J1, you don't include Y. I it see. is U plus I1 equivalent to J1. Got it. Uh, yes. Yeah, U after I1 should mm -hmm. give you the same thing as J1. It's actually, it would be like a uh, product of yeah, you and I1. Of I1 and U. Yeah, hmm. the term is a music. question. So, <coughs> each of the capital letter things is, is an object in the category, so it's a file. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the lower, lowercase things are morphisms in the category. Does that mean, as I recall, the morphisms were either at a line or delete a line or, or remove a line? Does, it, does that mean that every lowercase letter or lowercase letter or subscript of lowercase letter correspond to one insertion and one deletion? Yeah, well, at least one or more. Okay, so the, 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 the lowercase letters can apply more than a single insertion or deletion. Yeah. For the simple case, you would start with just single addition and deletion. And that's what the blog post does. Um, yeah. For the throughout the paper, I think it's only insertion that they define. And the blog post said that there was a bug in the paper. And oh yeah. The way that they proved deletion was not a proof. <laughs> it was wrong. Uh oh. Uh, yeah. So I think you should probably think just an insertion. That's a good point. But, yeah. And it actually says the same thing in the visual doc. You can you can delete data with with visual on the visual visual conflict documentation. So it talks a little bit about this exact problem. Yeah. Oh yeah. So they the blog post does say that visual has a workaround. So it's not that it's impossible, just that the paper did not do it correctly. I didn't wow, cover that in the talk. Finally, understand patches. <laughs> <laughs> Did you read where the name of the jewel comes from? It's a it's a crow of some kind. <laughs> I had actually never heard of that before. I'm into birds, and I'd never heard of them. <laughs> it's a bird that does uh, collaborative nest building. Right. No, that makes sense. That's all I have for you guys. Oh, well, thank, thank you. you. <laughs>